Sir, so I don't bother you here. Um, are you aware in the city of New York you can't have your engine idling in your truck for more than three minutes? Oh, man, come on, man. You're yeah. pain in the yeah. ass, man. I'd like to have you shut your engine off. You can't have it off for more than three minutes in the city of New York. I'm looking out for the better environment for my neighborhood. Man, come on, man. Please shut your engine off. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, listen, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. New York is a huge city. Eight million people. But actually, it's a bunch of small villages just tucked together. And it's a neighborhood thing, and people are very protective about their neighborhoods. And that's how it started with me me being concerned about a life quality issue in my particular neighborhood. People would just be idling by the curbside and they'd be reading a newspaper or eating their lunch or dinner or communicating in some mindless conversation with someone in the passenger seat, not even aware that they were churning out fumes. And I'd be trying to calculate just how horrible this sort of behavior was for our environment. And it made me angry and it made me want to do something. I began searching the web and found out through the EPA that indeed there were laws that were in existence since 1971, but they were seemingly not being enforced. So that made my focus even clearer. I, I wanted to find out who controls the law and who is neglecting its enforcement. So how did this law fall through the cracks? It seemed to me that the traffic patrol agents, the ones who write parking tickets, should be the ones to handle idling infractions as well. But idling wasn't on their checklist. Idling was considered a moving violation. So it fell to the regular police force, the ones busy serving the citizens of New York City and protecting them from more egregious offenses. And I think at this point it was clear what I had to do. I had to empower those traffic agents to enforce the law then maybe, just maybe, the air in my neighborhood and in my city might get cleaned up and a whole lot less oil would be wasted. And as the worst case, those who continue to violate the law could at least help close up some of the city's revenue shortfalls. Knowledge is power. So I decided I should learn as much as I could about exhaust spewing into my neighborhood. A short subway ride across the river into Queens led me to Exhaust Warehouse. The proprietor gladly gave me a tour of his 30,000 square foot facility and showed me some 500,000 tailpipe parts. He also shared with me his own unique perspective on the matter. Here are the chrome tips, stainless steel. You put this right here. And this is look like absolutely beautiful. I don't see any reason for the law to be against the uh, idol. I think uh, if the car is run uh, right, there is, when you idle, it doesn't make any difference. Do you let your customers idle their engines when they pull up to the garage area? No, I don't like, uh, no, absolutely not. My quest for knowledge led me to a tire and repair shop that claims to be the oldest inspection station in New York. The owner had many insights, 
but he wouldn't let me film him for fear of retribution. But he did direct me just down the street for some hard evidence. I was not satisfied to see some gunk on the end of a white rag. I had plenty more questions that needed to be answered. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. My journey led me to New England and two oracles of automotive knowledge. Some of you may recognize us, or at least recognize our voices. Uh, every week we dispense uh, dubious automotive advice to about four or five million listeners and some read our advice. Put the paper upside down yet, son. Sorry. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> various newspapers across the country, but uh, we're click and collect the Tappet Brothers, and, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I thought today we'd talk a little bit about idling. Now, Tom has always been a proponent of idling. In fact, he probably does it better than anyone. I mean, you might see him on a park bench someplace, oh, like we are now, wake up, trying to participate, or sipping his coffee in a cafe. And this is the kind of idling that, of course, we approve of, but there's lots of idling going on of internal combustion engines that we are dead set against, and that's why we're here. People ask all the time, if I decide to turn my engine off when I'm stopped waiting for somebody, is it injurious to the engine to restart it, you know, after five minutes? Is it harm the air conditioner? Is it a bigger load on the battery, et cetera, et cetera? And, and the, the most common myth is that it wastes fuel. Every time you restart an engine, you just, all the savings you had from not running it for five minutes go right out the tailpipe. Well, that's not true. It's a myth. It's a complete right. and utter myth. Uh, lots of people think idling is good for your engine. It's really not. Uh, it gums up your engine. Uh, your engine doesn't operate uh, at its full efficiency when it's idling. It's better to drive the vehicle. Everything's moving. Uh, it warms everything up all at once. Another myth is it takes a long time to warm up the engine. It does in 30 seconds and you touch it and whoop, it's hot. And if there's no snow on the vehicle, just take off. Driving is the best thing you can do for your vehicle. It warms up the interior, uh, circulates the coolant, the oil flows better, and it's the best thing you can do. Uh, people think that turning your car on and off is really hard on the starter, but these days with new electronics, there's very little drag on the starter, and it doesn't hurt it at all. You could turn your car on and off 20, 30 times a day, it wouldn't hurt at all. Like if you were sitting in traffic for a while, you shut it off. If you're waiting for somebody, shut it off. It's perfectly fine. We're going to seize this opportunity to lead the way forward and create the first environmentally sustainable 21st century city. 2007, when Mayor Bloomberg came out with Plan YC, people across the country said, wow, now New York's not only in the game, New York is now leading the pack. Just as I was beginning to get my neighbors to stop idling their engines, the city of New York announced Plan YC as a comprehensive study for all things ecological and a document that would make the city strive to become the most green city in the United States. And idling was one of many transportation emissions concerns in a section on air quality. And they only mentioned the three minute idling law once. Missing was any mention of efforts to enforce the 1971 law. What could I do to get it on their radar screen? Hi. Ever been in a movie? Never. <laughs> uh, I'm doing a documentary film on the uh, three minute idling law in New York City and was wondering if you guys could comment. Ever written a ticket on that officer? Not you call. Not you could call? Do you know the law? Absolutely. And I will uh, engine for uh, three minutes. But not of you guys have ever written tickets, huh? I've never enforced that, no. I was outraged that something as important as clean air could be so neglected. Realizing I was onto something and that at some point I'd be in front of some city official trying to make my case for enforcement, I decided to come up with some tools to help me document my encounters with idlers. I created an Excel spreadsheet 
And on a daily basis, I would mark off the date of the encounter, the age and the gender of the idler, and whether or not they knew the law. I wanted to have a statistical database and approach this scientifically, not just as a crank. We have uh, a guy named George Packenham coming to my attention who is so obsessed with this particular subject that he keeps an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and, on, and on the other hand, it's also it's a good cause. I mean, it's, it's something that most people probably aren't aware of as, as, a, as an issue to, to organize your life around. George is kind of the perfect uh, journalistic subject because he is his own reporter. He recorded and documented you know, nearly 2,000 encounters. It was, it's, it was a gift. It was sort of like be, you know, being handed hours of, of reporting already ready-made. The engagement process that I use in terms of walking up to idling drivers is quite simple. I walk up, rap on the window, and sort of motion to them to roll down their window. <laughs> and I'm astounded that they do, because I wouldn't roll down the window if some idiot came up to me, but they do. So I must have some sort of honest face or something. Would you roll down the window for me if I asked well, you? Well, you, 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 you have a kind demeanor. Well, I wouldn't roll down my window for this guy. <laughs> they roll down the window, and I'll say, I'm sorry to bother you, I always say that, but are you aware that in the city of New York it's illegal to have your engine idle more than three minutes and more than one minute in a school zone? And they usually reply with some sort of quizzical look as if they're confused and I realized that I needed to have a ready tool on hand to leave this knowledge with the drivers. The tool is a business card that on one side has the law spelled out on it, and on the other, the penalties associated with the law. And some people will take a good deal of time to read the card and actually become educated about the law, so it makes me feel good, like I'm an educator, not just a vigilante. I think having the card really helps because uh, it, it, it gives you, it's almost like a badge, it gives you a kind of a, a sense of authority. I've discovered that New Yorkers are not even aware that the three-minute rule exists. However, once asked to stop idling their engines, they're more than happy to do so. How do I know? Come with me, I'll show you. I was wondering if you were aware that in New York City you can't let your engine idle for more than three minutes. You might not be aware, but in the city of New York you can't idle your uh, engine of your truck for more than three minutes. Are you aware that in the city of New York you can't idle your car engine for more than three minutes? In the city of New York you can't idle your car engine for more than three minutes. That's a pity. Thank you. Failure, complete failure. After I'd seen George uh, conduct a few of his encounters, uh, he took the step of asking me to, to participate myself, which uh, was, came as a surprise to me. And, and I think of myself as someone who's, who probably errs on the side of being a little bit too too shy, too hesitant to get involved in other people's business. Citation! What is it? We have to talk about the fact that your engine's on. And it, you can't be on for more than three minutes. Okay. Now go do the rest of them. I just did. Okay, go do that one over there. I will. Bye. Okay. Thank you very have much. Have a good day. I've had the F-bomb half a dozen times or so in five years, and that's not a lot, but I've had some confrontations. You only dealing with sanitation? What about other, other trucks? What about other trucks? Oh. You only dealing with sanitation now? I've had so many conversations you only deal, with them. You only dealing with sanitation? Oh, that's untrue. Okay, well, then get everybody else. If you're going to do it, be fair. Oh, I shall be, be fair. fair. I will be. The law says you can't keep your engine idling for more than three minutes, right? Uh, yeah, actually, I just got here about two no, minutes no, ago. No, 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 because I went down the street, came back, went to my apartment, got my camera, and your engine oh, really? was out. Yes. All right, because I went in there and I just got food. I came out. It doesn't... Right, I'm it, it, That's fine. I'd like to see you shut the engine there off, my go. friend. It's my fault. I'm sorry. I apologize. Never again, right? Never again. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Some of the comments that people make are actually quite priceless. I have a column in my statistical log that lists the comments. One fella told me to go put my mouth around a tailpipe and stay there for a while, and that was pretty rude. And one guy said that his boss was worth $20 million and his boss didn't care about idling and neither did he. But I've had plenty of people thank me often and one guy even said, thank you, brother. So there can be a harmony that develops on this thing. It's, you know, it's not all uh, terror. I finally decided it was time to present my case for greater enforcement to the powers that be in New York. And when I started on this particular leg of the journey, I was very frustrated. I felt isolated and as if I was alone and in fact, I, I was alone, but with the statistics in hand, I went to City Hall and tried to get their attention on the matter and have them focus, but it was futile. And I went then to the Department of Transportation in the City of New York, showed them my statistics. They had no interest whatsoever. And it was very frustrating and I felt like giving up, but I didn't and uh, I realized I needed an ally. So. I started to go to nonprofit organizations that dealt with environmental issues. I didn't have any luck at first until finally, after three months of postponed appointments, I sat with the Environmental Defense Fund. And Isabel Silverman, the attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund, said, where have you been all my life? I have come to New York 12 years ago. And so since I've come to New York for 12 years, I have been walking up to people and ask them to turn off their engine. And initially when I came here, I was even so naive that once I saw this minivan idling, nobody in there, I saw that dirty old minivan. I climbed in from the passenger seat, turned off the engine, climbed out, come out of the car, I look up. These two huge guys are looking at me and saying, what are you doing in our car? And I said, well, I turned off your engine because you're polluting the air. And they said, this is my car. What are you doing in my car? I said, this is my environment and you're polluting the air. So um, I think if I had been a guy, they would have punched me. We struck up a friendship and a, a goal to go through the proper channels and have this brought to the attention of the mayor and the city council and to have laws changed and laws enforced and laws emphasized that would bring about the end of idling in the city of New York. One of the tragic ironies I consistently came across was the proliferation of vehicles idling for an otherwise noble purpose, emergency medical services. It's a paradox, really. Vehicles ready to help in a crisis at a moment's notice, while at the same time contributing to the long-term deterioration of the air in the city and the health of those who breathe it. Bingo! Sort of curious about how you just uh, idling your engine here for a couple minutes uh, without any particular purpose, it seems. Is there something we want to discuss here? The fire department has 220 firehouses and 32 EMS stations. The fire department also has 237 ambulances idling on the streets of New York, mostly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Idling of an, of an ambulance, a heavy-duty diesel vehicle, is bad for the crew members, bad for the environment, and bad for the community at large. Diesel exhaust is a, is a known carcinogen. It's not even considered a possible carcinogen. It's, it's a known carcinogen. Uh, I've been a paramedic for almost 10 years, and I'm inhaling it sometimes 16 hours a day, five days a week. How you doing? Oh, good. It's, it's me again, hoping to talk about why you guys idle why in the city of New York. constantly harass us? <clears throat> We're out here, you know what, number one, you can read this. This is from State of New York. Oh, good. The Department of Health. Love it. And that talks about idling vehicles. Okay. The Department of Health has said that no vehicles are allowed to idle for more than three minutes, except for emergency vehicles when they're active. The fire department has determined that we are active while idling. Only the fire department can come up with that argument. Um, you're active when you're sitting doing nothing. 
We're contracted by the fire department right. to be in a certain area. Okay, but so if someone goes into cardiac arrest right. in that area, right. that's where we're supposed to be. Okay. But you recognize that you're, okay. that you're polluting the area. Do you recognize that we are considered in an emergency mode? Bureau of EMS, the state of New York, okay. acknowledges this. All right. Because we don't have a firehouse to sit in right. or a hospital to sit in. Okay. We're supposed to sit in a three block radius. But I, but I and thought you it, can read that. But I thought it has to do with the, 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 the drugs at a certain temperature. Mode. Absolutely. Why do you think? Which drugs are, are, are to be kept at certain temperatures? That's my question. All the medications we have in the back. A paramedic ambulance it has uh, uh, dozens of medications and um, cold fluids, cold saline fluids stored on, on the ambulance. Keeping the vehicles up running is to keep the medications in the ambulance either room temperature or cold. And the only way to do that, other than plugging it into an electrical outlet, is to have the ambulance idling. Which are? Epinephrine, atropine, Lasix, nitroglycerin. And, and, and what temperatures are they supposed Would to be Would you like to them? look at the boxes? No, I'd just like to have you know. I'm what, telling what, you. What, what are they? It's supposed to be at room temperature. They're not supposed to be below certain degrees and above certain degrees. If you want to go online and you can look up epinephrine, atropine, nitroglycerin, and you can look at the temperature ranges that they're supposed to be. What you end up having is a $250,000 vehicle idling to run a $75 cooler. The um, plug in the back of the ambulance could solve that problem, but no one has put forth that solution. Please stop harassing us. I don't know if it's about harassment. I think it's about trying well, to you find know what? out what's then, going on. Then right here, you can go onto the website, you can call the Department of Health, you can call the fire department, you can call Lennox Hill Hospital. I will be more than happy to give you the number. Please do. This is getting to the point now well, where you're harassing us. I don't think that's the case. Okay. Not if you're polluting my neighborhood, sir. Okay. Well, you know what? We're supposed to be in your neighborhood, according to the fire department regulations in the three block area. There's an ambulance on 79th Street, there's an ambulance on 59th Street. Uh, and if somebody drops dead on that corner and goes into cardiac arrest, then I'm glad we're having this conversation. Right. So am I. One of the arguments for sitting on street corners is being able to respond to emergencies. You think by having us sit on a street corner idling our vehicles, we would be able to respond to an emergency faster. Our response times were more than two and a half minutes slower than a fire engine to the same emergency. Well, you know, I'm tired of the air pollution in New York City. And that's why I'm and doing what I'm doing. The cars and the trucks and the 18 wheelers going by, uh, they don't pollute the air. But unfortunately, people can't idle for more than three minutes in the city of New York without violating the law. That is the law. And, and that's how supervisors in the state of New York, that's idling of emergency being I, I greatly, New York State policy. I greatly appreciate your time and energy. You're My name is Matt. Matt? Manny. Manny George Packenham. Thank you. I'm sure we'll speak again. Thank you. So if you just put one ambulance at each firehouse or EMS station, you would solve the problem of idling that simply. EMS trucks weren't the only vehicles left running for otherwise useful purposes. Con Ed had far and away the highest track record of repeat offenses in my spreadsheet of any corporate offender. sugar coffee break, Con Ed, but I'm sure you're aware that you can't have your engine idling for more than three minutes in the city of New York. Yeah, so how come it's on? Huh? No, no, I was in the, I was in the coffee shop for a while. You were, the engine was on then. I come out now. I went to my apartment and I got my machine here. And your engine's still on. So I, I'm going to ask you to shut your engine off. Leave it. It looks like you're staying and you're filling out a report. And I'm leaving. People don't like being told what to do, even if even if it's for your own good. So I think people just are reluctant to say, oh, yeah, it may be that they're resistant at first, but after a while, I think they might think once it's easy. It is costing me money. It's not harming my engine to shut it off. It's not wasting gas if I've been saving gas. You know, when you're idling, you are not getting zero miles per gallon. You're getting negative miles per gallon. Persistence is alone omnipotent. And eventually we succeeded in working our way through city council, through councilman Dan Garodnik's office, 
where he formulated a bill to have all 2,300 traffic agents become officially capable of writing tickets for idling. And that became the cornerstone for our work. We've got 2,500 officers out there on the street. They are on the ground right now. Uh, and they today don't have the power to issue a ticket for idling. Our bill uh, strengthens their ability to deal with this problem and allows them to write a ticket for idling. They're the ones who need to do it. They are right there. They're the boots on the ground, and they're going to have the tools to be able to enforce the law. Just this morning, I dropped my son off at school. A huge line of school buses were parked just outside the school. Fumes spewing from the exhaust pipes. And that it's an unacceptable practice. That's what it has to become. Unacceptable practice to park your car and leave your engine running. When idling is taking place by our schools, we need to also maybe engage our police precincts to really uphold the law and make sure that these fines are issued. If, if people say, what's the big deal? Well, stand behind a bus for three minutes and keep breathing, and then you know what a big deal it is. If all of New Yorkers stopped idling, we estimate $30 million could be saved in New York City alone per year. We're talking about taking off the roads the equivalent in carbon dioxide of 12 to 13,000 cars. For the 320,000 children in our city that are living with asthma, this air pollution is really complicating their ability to lead a healthy, active life. And our children's lungs can no longer afford motor vehicles being used as personal climate control devices. We have to get people to turn their engines off. The other effluents I look at in the pollution of tailpipe exhaust are the NOx. And the nitrogen oxides combined with volatile organic carbon, when it reacts with sunlight, creates what's called ozone. And ozone floats around in the atmosphere, and when you breathe in ozone, it's like getting a sunburn on your lung. We respond to quite a number of respiratory emergencies on a daily basis. And we're contributing to those respiratory emergencies by idling a heavy-duty diesel vehicle. And I sometimes wonder, did I contribute to this person's attack? I mean, were they just walking by my ambulance, you know, inhaled some, some small particulate matter, some ozone, and that was what pushed them over the edge to calling 911? More often than not, we talk about disputes between boyfriend, girlfriend, and between spouses. My husband says, for example, yeah. I should start the car up in the morning and let it idle for 10 minutes before I drive to work. Yeah. And we say, your husband is nuts. <laughs> because he his head up. <laughs> <laughs> up his tailpipe. <laughs> You know, what's that town, what's, what's that town way up in New York State, Messina, where it's like always like 28 below? You, you might want to warm it up for a minute or so in the morning before you start doing 60. But if you live anyplace else where the temperatures don't go to those depths, uh, you just start it up and, and drive. It should be noted that reduced idling isn't the only way to reduce emissions in the city. Con Ed began using the less polluting, American-made biodiesel fuel in their trucks. They also produced this training video for all 12,000 employees. Unless there's an operational reason to leave a company vehicle idling, Con Edison policy is that a standing vehicle should not be allowed to run for more than three minutes. There are very good reasons for making sure the three-minute rule is strictly observed. There's certain groups of the public that are, are focused on idling laws as of late, and uh, in particular, people's non-compliance. So employees should bear in mind that not only is it a good thing to do from a health standpoint, from a cost standpoint, but there's also people watching. Why it may have re reached as large an audience as it did uh, can be explained through a quote that George gave to me, which I think helped frame this in, in a kind of you know, almost universal way, which is that he said, engine idling is, is, uh, is really like secondhand smoke. It's an analogy that he, that he used to compare this thing that most people don't think of to something like secondhand smoke that now everyone thinks of. You can, of course, enjoy yourself in your idling vehicle. If everyone does the same, 
There will be no more fresh air, and everyone will be unhappy. You are comfortable, but the world suffers. Be considerate. Switch off your vehicle's idling engine. It's everyone's responsibility to protect the environment. Two kids struck and killed by a runaway van in Chinatown. The children were returning from daycare when that idling van was parked without its emergency brake engaged. It careened in reverse down the busy street. The van's driver was not charged. Justice for Haley and Diego! Now! Justice for Haley and Diego! Now! And now we're standing here today to deliver the message to the DA. What do you intend to do? We cannot turn our backs and condone reckless driving. We cannot turn our backs and ignore the seriousness and the safety of our children. What kind of city is this when it does not protect its most vulnerable citizens? Child or adult, this tragedy proves that the streets of Chinatown are dangerous and the city should be investigating what happened, how it happened, and more importantly, how to prevent things like this from happening in the future. Last week, this city was witness to the most horrific tragedy you can possibly imagine where two young kids were mowed down by a commercial van. A van was left idling by the driver, thinking that he had left the van idling in park, when unfortunately it was left in reverse. We should be strengthening the anti-idling laws. Uh, the key here is that 70%, 77% will shut off their engines with only me asking them to do that. Imagine how agreeable New York City citizens would be if more knew about the law, uh, when roughly only 25% know about it, and how much quicker they would know about it if police enforced it and fines were imposed. So traffic agents that would give idling tickets could raise a lot of revenues for the city. Our calculation shows $2 million per agent per year in ticket revenues because idling is so prevalent in New York City. Hold on a minute. Did you hear what Isabel just said? 2,300 officers times $2 million per officer equals $4.6 billion. New York City is carrying a potential budget deficit of over $4 billion. I mean, it's shocking, and here we're talking about cutting our budget. Mayor Mike, you've donated millions to stop smoking worldwide. You've pushed through laws here in New York City to stop smoking in restaurants. Bravo. You're a superb leader, sir. I have voted for you twice. Please take the no engine idling laws in New York City seriously. If you enforce these laws, you will take a giant step towards reducing air pollution in this city. Eventually, once the laws are enforced, I suspect our fellow New Yorkers will, by their own volition, shut off engines. I made that plea to Mayor Bloomberg in January 2007. And look at the great strides made towards enforcing the 1971 law in February 2009, only 38 years later. The bill signed that day called for reduced engine idling times in school zones to one minute and ticket issuance by sanitation and parks officers and mandatory reporting on annual revenues raised. In addition, the Taxi and Limousine Commission would be required to evaluate applicants' awareness of idling laws. There are parts of the city where kids go to the hospital uh, for asthma at four times the national rate. The national rate is 5%. Overall, in New York, it's 9%. In some of our neighborhoods, it's 25%. Yeah. Consistent enforcement is the only way that New Yorkers will finally get the message that unnecessary curbside idling is no longer tolerated in our city. I'd like to present you with a memento of today's event. This is a card, and on one side has the idling law on it, on the other side has the penalties associated with it. And I've used this card for the past two and a half years. In two and a half years, I have uh, done this about 1,600 times. Uh, I'm 80% successful, Mr. Mayor. I was going to say, I was waiting for the results. Uh, I'm approximately 80% successful over two years. Uh, I had been doing this, I've been doing this as a vigilante, so to speak. Had, had I been doing it as a member of the police force, I would have generated approximately $350,000 worth of income. Uh, any, anyone else? Sign the bills.
One thing led to another, and the bill was put before city council. However, it was rejected. The powers that be in the police department did not want to be told what to do. They didn't want to be pushed to enforce this law, and they proclaimed that they would enforce the law themselves. I did ask for a private meeting with NYPD so I could make sure the law would be enforced. And NYPD traffic side told Isabel and me that they would take it on their own shoulders to begin within two to three months writing tickets. Uh, New York City Chief of Transportation Michael Scagnelli regrets that he could not be here this morning, but he has um, asked me to give you this statement. Mm -hmm. In compliance with the new laws, the New York City Police Department intends to put as much priority to ticketing and idling violation as to any other summons. At this time, city agencies and the vendor of technology are working to reprogram handheld computers to ticket vehicles that exceed the three-minute idling law citywide and the one-minute idling law in school zones. Now classified as both a moving violation and a parking violation, idling tickets can carry a maximum fine of $115 that attaches to the vehicle rather than the driver. Hold on one more moment. During the city council meeting just five months before, Isabel projected each traffic agent could generate $2 million per year based on a $220 fine per ticket. Then why was the fine brought down to $115? Once the current technology delay is over, which is expected within the month, NYPD traffic agents will be on the street timing and issuing tickets to drivers who idle. Yay. After all this, Chief Scagnelli resigned three weeks later, announcing his early retirement, making the whole police self-enforcement movement get really shaky quickly. Last night I went to a gala from the League of Conservation Voters. Matt Bloomberg came. I walked up to him as he was walking out. He has seen me many times. I said to him, you know, remember me, I'm the one who has been harassing you about idling. And he said, yes. He said, tomorrow I'm going to be training NYPD officers on anti-idling enforcement. And then Matt Bloomberg said, oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, I now have in my car, he said, a sticker that says no idling. And I went to one of his bodyguards and his bodyguard actually confirmed that. That Matt Bloomberg hates idling now. and. Um, that they're changing that. And I also mentioned to Matt Bloomberg two months ago, I told these bodyguards to turn off the engine, and they did. Front page, July 23rd, 2009. Practice what you preach, Mayor. That was the message yesterday from environmental advocates and the New Yorkers to the news that Mayor Michael Bloomberg often lets his own official vehicle idle. The city council man, John Liu, said he believes only vehicles handling emergencies are exempt. Total of the exemption for the emergency vehicles, Zet Jones, 39 of Jamaica, replied, an emergency is a person with a heart attack from gas exhaust. Mayor Michael Bloomberg on the John Gambling Show. All right, 23 minutes now after 8 o'clock. Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Friday John Gambling Show. I'm assuming the cars downstairs are turned off. Um, one can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if they're if they're found not to be, there's going to be more. Well, a lot of smoke. Right? Well, it's I did I did plan. have uh, last couple of days conversations with the inspector who runs all of the security for City Hall and the elected officials. Uh, I pointed out that that sign on the that I had them put on the dashboard, no idling, meant. No idling. The public has a right to expect us to do what we ask them to do. So at the oh. moment, it, you didn't know that it was idling? Uh, no, and should I have checked? I suppose in retrospect, the mayor's cars should set an example. There is no excuse.
George Pakenham works for an international mortgage desk on Wall Street, but his business cards are printed with Section 4-08, Subsection P of the New York City Traffic Code as it pertains to engine idling. Roughly speaking, it is prohibited for more than three minutes and carries potential fines of several hundred dollars. Pakenham is concerned about the quality of the air and the quantity of oil, and he has distributed nearly 2,000 cards. Nearly 2,000 cards over the past two and a half years to drivers who refuse to shut off their engines at curbside. He typically begins with a rap on the window and a preemptive apology. We live on the Upper West Side, and uh, I lived here 50 years ago as a single person. And then we got married and we moved to uh, Long Island, and we've been there for 50 years and came back to the city. And I feel as if I were coming home. So I feel very proprietary about coming home. And therefore, when I uh, saw people uh, idling their engines at the, at the curb, realizing how much gas they were wasting and polluting the environment, I went over to the window and I said, Are you aware that it's illegal to keep your engine idling for more than three minutes? Are you moving? Right, right now. Okay. You know, it's illegal to leave your car idling. Oh, okay. Thank you. And people have been very cooperative. And you would save yourself money, gas, and the environment. And then I read in the New Yorker about George Pakenham, who's doing the same thing. But he's got cards that he's handing out with the law on one side and the penalties on the other. So I decide, I call the New Yorker and I say, put me in touch with Mr. Pakenham, which he does. In 10 minutes, Mr. Pakenham calls me back. And we get together and he has his cards with him and he gives them to me and they've got the law printed on one side and the penalty printed on the other. And I said, can you give me a hundred? And he says, sure. I said, well, I'll pay for them. He says, no, you won't pay for them. I said, well, do you like chocolate chip cookies? He says, I love chocolate chip cookies. So that was the beginning of our uh, friendship. Uh, Here, would you like to have one of these? Yes. Yeah. I'm now off with a new mission in life. What they say? They have a dog inside that needs air conditioning. The New Yorker feature ignited more than just Barbara. CBS News ran a piece in which a reporter walked up to idling cars and trucks, including an idling DEP van, timed how long each vehicle idled, and asked the driver to shut off their engines. This will be great for me to shut the engine off. And not long after that, they put a microphone on my lapel and filmed me in Lower Manhattan as I encountered driver after driver mindlessly idling their engines. It's ridiculous. Doesn't make any sense. Amidst all this, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo fined Fresh Direct $50,000 for engine idling violations and had that company promise to obtain auto shutoff devices for their trucks and vans. The story got some wings on its own, almost literally. I was interviewed by the Financial Times of London, and then in turn, the BBC gave me some airtime. New York has its own green hero in the form of a Wall Street banker called George Pakenham. I spoke to him earlier and asked why he felt so aggrieved by this behavior. Hot on the BBC's heels was a talk radio program in South Africa. We picked up a story in the Financial Times and it was a story about an engine idler activist. And it's just a lovely story about somebody feeling passionate about something that is doing the air around us no good at all. Plus, it's wasting uh, petrol, which is uh, massively expensive, and decides to do something about it. Stateside, I found myself broadcast on NPR. So it'll be great for the sake of better air that you can shut off the car okay, engine. I will. Here, yeah. hang on to this. Thank you, know. you. Thank you very much. Well, that was amicable. That's George Pakenham trying to get a New York driver to stop idling his car. He's a Wall Street banker who's concerned that a 1971 law banning idling is not being enforced. It's his own one-man awareness campaign. We read about George in The New Yorker. Do people always respond that way? I have done this about 1,800 times over two and a half years. And I'm about 80% successful. And you keep track of everything on an Excel spreadsheet. Why? I mean, this is time-consuming. You're... Uh, going out on the streets, interacting with perfect strangers. Why do you do this? Why indeed? Well, life became a bit difficult for me when my brother quickly developed stage four lung cancer. She does. It feels so good what you're doing to my feet, girls. 
I really am enjoying it a lot. <laughs> what are you laughing about? It feels very, very good. Oh, wait a minute. Bobby. Maybe this is my imagination. It's actually Chip. <laughs> my brother was one of my heroes. As strong as a bull and oh, as warm a heart as you might want to find. And my brother took three years to die, so the death was actually a blessing in the end because he suffered so and the cancer spread from his lungs to his entire body. And death was a relief, but it was the fact that he got lung cancer. He, he spent the last 10 years of his life mostly in the pristine environment of New Hampshire and it made no sense. So it was an underlying theme for me and a motivator for me to get involved. There was another trigger involved that had to do with me seeing a news piece on 60 Minutes. From the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person and that he needed to go. There are memos. One of them, marked secret, says a plan for post-Saddam Iraq. The story enlightened me and moved me in my thinking about how we went to war for oil and how mindless our citizenry is towards this issue. The irony of oil to me is the amount of money we spend as individuals and as a nation on something that we mostly just burn. Sure, oil is also used in the manufacture of consumer products, but mostly it's used for fuel and as I've learned on my journey, burned standing still. Oil drives us to war, even when it's not driving us around. Burning oil is warming our world in ways we just are beginning to understand, at the same time as it's warming our bodies for just one or two extra minutes of avoiding the elements. As I told CBS local TV, it just doesn't make any sense. The year 1980, the United States will not be dependent on any other country for the energy we need to enact this urgent 10-year program for energy independence. Our decision about energy will test the character of the American people. We will make our country less dependent on foreign sources of energy. Washington's been talking about our oil addiction for the last 30 years. Now is the time to end this addiction. It's not news that America's dependence on foreign oil is a key threat to our national security. We've got to be ready for the consequences. We've got to try to prevent where we can those uh, consequences from taking place. If we don't take action now, every day, every year that goes by, the options for dealing with the effects of climate change and the effects of energy security become much, much more expensive. In fact, some of the options completely go away. For months, I had all these negative and confusing thoughts occupying my mind. War, waste, global warming, my brother's battle. And as my awareness grew and my anger at the thoughtlessness rampant in my own neighborhood, as I thought about what I could do about this whole mess, its breadth as a global issue, and the obstacles and indifference I encountered in my own crusade, I couldn't help but think, who was I? What could one man with a business card and a spreadsheet really accomplish? But I wasn't going to let the fight be considered over by any means. I began my own regiment of walking up to traffic agents and keeping records and asking them if they knew about the law yet and to see if they'd had their computers changed yet and to see if they'd written any tickets. But month after month through September, October, November 2009, everyone that I'd met had not gone through the drill yet. Global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are 30 years away. 30 years? That won't affect me. One of my pivotal experiences as a child that made me become an environmentalist was when I was standing in our garage at home. And in Switzerland, in the garage where you keep your car, we had to put up a plaque and it said, if you, you, if you have the door closed with the engine running, you could die. So I remember looking up and thinking, if it's bad in here, 
it's bad out there. It must have an effect on the environment. In the Bronx, two young girls are hospitalized after they were found unconscious in a car as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning. The girls, ages four and nine, were left in the back seat as their mother cleaned snow off their vehicle. It appears that the tailpipe was clogged with snow, sending carbon monoxide back inside the car. Describe the internal combustion engine for me. <laughs> one, of us, one, one, of, one of us should know. One of us should know this. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So iLink also creates greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, you cannot see them coming out of the tailpipe, but we can measure them. This device behind me shows about using up too much oil and we're concerned about warming up the planet and and specifically warming up new york city realize how much heat comes out of a car when it's running it's unbelievable and the, the temperature in the city on a hot day probably goes up a couple of degrees because of all the vehicles that are in the city and, and if you compound it by taking vehicles that aren't going any place but just running their engines so that one person in the car can keep cool while he sits and waits for somebody, that's preposterous. So who are you? I'm Kevin from Mammoth Event. Yeah. We're a moving company. We've been operating trucks for 15 years. This is our first clean air diesel. This is a different version of a diesel engine. It's it, if you stand behind it while I run it, you'll notice that it smells like a, a pool, like chlorine. It, it smells like a pool. <laughs> it, it smells like you're standing next to somebody's pool. It smells like chlorine. It's, it's a lot better for the environment. There's, I, I've had work for me in the past that would actually get sick standing behind the truck from the exhaust fumes. But this, just like I said, smells like a chlorine pool. It's, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and how long have you had it? We've had it for a year now. And the results? Awesome. I mean, we don't, we, we don't stop. We don't have to non idle in truck stop parking lots. We don't have to hook up to the exhaust ex exhaust eaters at the truck stops because it's a clean air diesel. And what it cost you to install? If we bought it like this. Any extra fees? It's, it's a little more expensive, but in the long run, everybody's going to have them. <laughs> what do you intend to do? We cannot turn our backs and condone reckless driving. A new bill targets drivers who walk away from their cars with the engine still running. By a nearly unanimous vote, the city council passed a bill to strengthen penalties against drivers who leave their vehicle unattended with the key still in the ignition. The old fee was $5 for leaving a key in the ignition for longer than three minutes. Now drivers who leave their cars unattended for any amount of time will have to pay a fine of $250. This comes after several deadly accidents around the city that involve vehicles that were left unattended. Tell me about the slogan here. We deliver clean air for you. What does that mean? It's an electric truck. You have an electric truck now? Yeah. What's it all about? It's battery operated. It plugs into this here. It plugs in like all of it. That's pretty good. Yeah. What, so no more diesel used? Not in this neighborhood, no. Oh, why? Uh, just this neighborhood alone? Yeah. The tenants around the neighborhood requested it. Uh, and how did they put forth the request? Just through Washington. 
Washington. So the local people organized, sent a petition, they got action. Yep. Hello, I'm George Bell, and uh, I'm here on the site, and um, I just want to say that uh, Con Ed's been taking the lead for uh, having the engines shut off, and they've been instituting certain uh, cutoff systems for the engines to automatically shut off, like uh, up to three minutes, for the commercial vehicles that we use. That's terrific, and, and you know, what sort of savings will that do for the environment or for dollars? Both you know? for Con Ed uh, and savings, because we use biofuel, biodiesel, so it is much more expensive, and plus it helps the environment because it doesn't pollute the air that much. So Con Edison is taking the lead on two fronts in just that alone. That's fantastic, man. I'll probably get fired tomorrow. <laughs> you, you, you get a promotion. What, are you kidding? No, I don't want that. Con Ed was the biggest uh, offender of the law, but over the course of several years, they shifted to biodiesel and they shifted to auto shutoff. Well, that's great. They're setting a great example for everybody. So everyone sees Con Ed turning off their vehicles, and it makes sense that they should because well, they provide all the electricity for the city, you know, so they, they should be the ones who are, who are most interested in conveying this message that we need to conserve. It's January 22nd, breakthrough day. I talked to a uh, New York City traffic agent today. His name was Dawkins. And he said that in the past few weeks, he has done a ticket for idling. And it's the first one I've come across. He's been the first. So uh, it's a day of jubilation for me. That guy behind me is idling, by the way. I just wanted to clean up my neighborhood. Through my efforts, I became aware that I could change my world. So, how does this apply to you? What's your motivation? If you're enraged that we would wage a war for oil contracts, just shut the engine off. If you're concerned that foreign oil dependence threatens our national security, just turn off your engine. If you want to prevent climate change, and keep the world livable for the next generation. Turn off your engines. If you hate waste and want it to stretch your fuel dollar. We can make a difference right in our neighborhoods just simply by turning it off. Or if you just want better air for our children to breathe, remember the resounding words of Councilman Robert Jackson. Turn it off! Going idle free is not just a New York City issue. It impacts cities, and towns around the world. So if you've had it with mindless idlers fouling up your neighborhood, say something, do something. Just walk up to them and ask them to please turn it off.
no, no. Is there a makeup artist in the house for these guys? Just go, come on. This is good. This is good. This is good. That's George. Wait a minute, George. Anyway, we've already been there. There, that was that hair was out of place. <laughs> Which one of you two is smarter? Me. Him. Tommy is the Tommy is the king of Ireland. I think that's I think that's ogling. <laughs> ogling, ogling too. Ogling. Yeah. yeah. What themes are most talked about on your radio show? Beans? <laughs> beans? What beans? What beans? Well, beans. We never talk about no, we don't beans. talk about beans, no. You know, what, what <laughs> unless Tom is gassed at Do you sometimes feel the effects of too much CO2 when you're in the garage? <laughs> This, 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 this is exhibit A. It's a, a lifelong like, overexposure <laughs> to, to CO2, CO, about? and all the other things. What are you talking about? That's all right. Just, just relax. Have some coffee. <laughs> For five years, I, I kept... I, he was tired, and, and he needed to idle. He needed to idle, so I, you all right? It's all right? It's all right. <laughs> Are you done with idling? No, I'm not. <laughs>